Welcome everyone to the Healthy School Food Summit brought to you by the Coalition for Healthy School Food and Plant Pure. I'm your host, Ron Gandiza. In this session, we are honored to have with us chef and author Kim Campbell. Kim is the author of the Plant Pure Nation cookbook and the new Plant Pure Kitchen, where she developed over 280 recipes using whole food plant-based ingredients and no processed oils. Kim has been a plant-based cook for 25 years experimenting and preparing meals for her family and friends. Kim graduated from Cornell University with a BS in Human Services Studies uh, with a concentration in Nutrition and Child Development. And she later received a teaching certificate and went on to teach in various grades from kindergarten to high school. She also raised three children with her husband, often teaching in their schools. And Kim's passion has always been recipe development and culinary education, especially for families and children. She has taught cooking classes in her local community and now through Plant Pure, uh, where she currently directs recipe development and culinary education. Welcome, Kim. Thank you for having me, Ron. I'm glad to be here. As a chef, I can attest to how delicious whole food plant-based eating can be. And a lot of that I attribute to you uh, through your cookbook, which my family uses, and of course, having tried your meals firsthand and with the recipe you developer for Plant Pure. So thank you so much for the delicious food. Well, thank you. It's actually not hard when you've got all, a, a variety of vegetables to choose from. It actually is a very creative process. Well, I'd like to learn more about how you got creative with it. And really, how did you get started first? When did you start eating plant-based? You know, I became really interested in nutrition when I was about 16 years old, and I met Nelson not long after that. We grew up in the same town, went to high school together, and Colin was doing his research um, in China and bringing back lots of information and lots of data and sharing it with all of us. So I became excited about it, and it it sort of um, solidified my interest in nutrition. So I went on to college to study dietetics, um, ended up becoming, uh, having a degree in education and teaching um, because I wasn't really excited about the traditional uh, nutrition that they were teaching in the colleges at the time, which they're still teaching some of that. Um, And and I wasn't 100% plant-based after college. Nelson and I got married. We were pretty young. We got married at 23 and we were, we were, I would say 80% there. And we thought we were 100% because of, you know, all the things that we were doing. But as we, as we got better at it, we just kept improving. And it wasn't until the kids were born that we decided we had to get really serious and jump on board and, and do this the right way. With kids, uh, did you raise them plant-based from, from, the, from the beginning? Yep, pretty much. Um, I nursed all three, three kids, and I was plant-based when I was nursing. So they were, they were getting the benefits of that. And then as we weaned them, we weaned them right from, you know, breast milk to everything pretty much that we were eating. And I I have to say, though, that we weren't perfect. You know, that was back in 1991 when our first child was born. And we, we were still learning and discovering things that we could do better and better. So I won't say our kids never had animal products. They did. Um. Uh, we, we can get into that later about my philosophy of when they left the home and went to schools and friends, friends homes. But um, I think that they were pretty, you know, pretty good plant based eaters in the, in the house. Were we uh, always perfect at it? Not always. When I, when I talk about that, I mean, we we were using more processed foods than I'd like to admit. Um, there weren't a lot available at the time, but what was out there, we were actually using some of that. And we felt like we were doing, you know, we, we were doing the right thing. But looking back, I think the whole food part of the whole food plant-based diet, um, we weren't doing 100%. What would you say was the most difficult? I know there's probably a lot of challenges, but first and foremost in your mind when you think back. Right. I think it was navigating through the processed foods. Um, because there are so many processed foods. I mean, look at the cereal aisle. When you go up and down the cereal aisle, uh, 95% of what's in that aisle is not whole food. It's not whole grain. So just navigating around that because, you know, our kids were active. They played sports and, you know, they went to public schools and private schools and I was working full time. So we were trying to, you know, do things that were efficient. Also, you know, um, 
trying not to spend a lot of money at the same time. So uh, looking back, you know, those veggie burgers and the, the veggie meat, you know, some of those things made my life easier, but I don't think that it was necessarily the optimal um, diet for them. So I think navigating around all the processed foods that are available to us is the hardest thing. Not only were you a parent, but you were a teacher. How was nutrition taught in school? Basically, the four basic food groups, you know, you've, you know, that your, your plate is the center of your plate is, is meat. And you always incorporate dairy or a glass of milk. And, and actually, our kids went to school in rural North Carolina. So one thing that was a real eye opener for me was to see how, how many kids were actually eating in fast food restaurants. That blew me away. I had no idea that the average person in, the, in, in these rural communities was eating at fast food restaurants three to five times, um, three to five meals a week um, and not drinking water, predominantly soda. There were soda machines in the schools, um, in the public schools and the private schools. So it was an eye opener for, for me and also for the children as well, because they were, they were kind of taken back with, with how different meals looked when they went to public schools. You know, I, I remember that even back home in Hawaii, where we would take breaks from class, you know, we'd, mm-hmm. be, I guess, recess, uh, but, or even in between classes, and there would be a room where you could buy snacks, and the snacks were candies, chips, yeah. sodas. That was the recommended snack room, you know. Right. If you're getting ready for your next class and you need to, to be up, you know, they'd say, buy a soda, have your caffeine so you can stay up for that class. It yep. was actually promoted by the school, you know, and they were making money selling as yep. part of a snack room. So I'm curious now, do, have you seen a change? Well, I haven't been in the public school systems for a while. Our last child graduated uh, about three, four years ago. So I haven't been, you know, been actively teaching or been involved in that. But I think they do still have a lot of those vending machines. Um, the regulations have changed a little bit about when these are made available to the kids, when they can use them. Um, I think it's after school, what they can use these profits for. And the laws are ever changing. So I, you know, Ron, I, I don't know if I'm going to be real accurate, but I, I, I pretty much think there are still a lot of processed foods that are available to the kids. One story that was really interesting that I wanted to share today, um, our oldest child, Whitney, when she was in the private school, um, she went, they like to buy their lunch. And once in a while, you know, I'd let them buy their lunch and they would pick the, the they'd look at the menu and they'd pick the menu that was closest to plant-based that they could eat healthy. And the one that they always picked was the baked potato bar. And on the baked potato bar, there were, um, there was cheese, there was sour cream, um, all kinds of, you know, pretty much animal-based foods. And then the potato. So when she got her potato, she went over to the salad bar and filled her plate. She basically put the potato in the middle of the plate and filled it with salad and then put some dressing over the salad and some salt and pepper on the potato and got up to the register. And the lady at the register told her that she was going to charge her, I think it was a dollar fifty extra for the salad. And she was shocked. This is a fifth grade student. And she said, well, if you get the potato chips instead of the salad, I won't charge you. So for a child that's 12 years old and being told all the wrong things in school and growing up in our home, it just, it seemed so unfair to her. (laughs) And I remember uh, her coming home and complaining about it. And I said, well, you know what? You just learned your first lesson about school, the school lunch program. Um, But I just thought that was really interesting that you would tell a child that to get the potato chips, we won't charge you to go with your baked potato. But if you want to put any vegetables on there, it's not happening. (laughs) Well, that that blows my mind because uh-huh. it's such a it's a lesson that they take as a child, and it perpetuates, yeah, and even strengthens as they go through the years in school, and that's yep. the way the norm mm-hmm. in society is, and that's a shame. And mm-hmm. as we say, one of the the focuses of the Healthy School Food Summit is to try to create these healthy habits when they're much younger. Exactly. Now, that brings me up to uh, another question I'd like to ask oh, for your kids. I know they must have been an integral part of you developing your yeah. recipes. So how, how did they help you to shape the recipes you created? 
Right. Well, you know, I believe that when we're raising children, uh, we're forming habits. You're teaching them, you know, how to interact with people and you're teaching them all kinds of things, not just nutrition. So, you know, enabling them to go out in the world and make really healthy choices. So part of of teaching those habits for me was getting them in the kitchen at a very young age. Um, and they, you know, they were literally two years old, pushing the stool up against the counter and helping me mix and stir. And um, there were a couple accidents here and there. And, it, you know, that, that was part of it. But by the time they were six to 10 years old, they were able to put a meal together. Um, and, and, and they were good cooks. And, you know, to this, to this day, all three of them are, are very talented cooks. And in fact, they look at the cookbooks and say, these, these are our recipes, um, because they remember making things like lasagna and roasted vegetables and veggie burgers, because they actually helped develop them as well, because I had a lot of, um, a lot of help from them. So I think just having these habits, getting kids in the kitchen, getting them connected to their food. And, and enjoying it. And another thing that we did um, that was, you know, just just ha- forming habits was sitting around the table and enjoying the meal that we prepared. Um, you know, the, the f- five of us setting the table and talking about our day and enjoying the food or maybe not enjoying the food if it was something they didn't didn't love that particular night. But but we did that every single night. So now as adults, they come back home and Nelson and I don't always sit at the table because we're empty nesters. And they're, they're just shocked that we don't sit down at the table every night. But see, I did that for them because I was trying to form, you know, habits around around food and for them to be connected as a family. Now, what were their favorite dishes? So you mentioned a few. I'm thinking veggie burgers. Yeah. You know, lasagna was the, probably the most popular one, Ron. Uh, lasagna and burritos. And they loved those meals where it was build your own, uh, making a potato bar and then making all the toppings and putting those out. Uh, we do a taco bar where, you know, we put the tortillas and the beans and all the different things. So they really liked those kinds of meals. Um, they loved lasagna. Anything pasta was popular in my house. <laughs> so did you use whole whole wheat pasta? Whole wheat pasta. Um, I, I tend to use brown rice pasta uh, just because to me it has more of a consistency of white pasta, which I still haven't gotten over those white pasta days. <laughs> so I, I really like the brown rice pasta. But the kids, that was really popular. I, I call that a kid food in our house because they all, all three really like that. Well, now we have a lot of people concerned about gluten. Interesting thing about gluten is if you eat a whole food diet and you're really not eating things out of a can, a bag, and a box a a fair amount, you'll end up reducing the amount of gluten because, uh, you know, all the processed foods is is where you see things like wheat gluten and, and, and wheat that's hidden, flours that are hidden in there. But I think the closer you get to a whole food diet, the less gluten you're going to have. Um, so that's what I found with the second cookbook. I didn't intend for it to be a gluten-free cookbook, um, but I would say the majority of the recipes are gluten-free or can be made gluten-free very easily. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about smoothies? Because they're popular with kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, my grandson is four. Really, he comes to me almost practically every day asking me if I'd like a smoothie. And we put a lot of kale. I mean, we put a lot of greens in, and it kale, baby spinach, and of course, blueberries and bananas and, and uh, our almond milk kind of is the base. So what's your take on, on smoothies? Is that something that we should limit for kids or? You know, I, I think the most important thing is that kids learn to drink water and drink it often throughout the day. And, and, you know, I think a lot of adults struggle with drinking water. So, you know, we look towards always putting something in the water, like a lemon or because we don't, we don't really enjoy just plain water. So I think that's an important habit for kids. But I do think that smoothies have a time and a place. And I think once in a while as a treat, whether you're making them for maybe a dessert or it's a hot summer day and you're making a smoothie because it's fun, I think that's fine. But if you're in the habit of doing smoothies, you know, every day or a couple times a day, um, probably they're getting more sugar, you know, more of a sugar load than they need to. One of the things I do with smoothies is um, you can put them in little popsicle. This is a trick for your grandson. Put, put, put the smoothie in the popsicle holder, and then, then they're getting less of it, and it feels like a popsicle on a hot day. So that, that's kind of fun, too. 
how do you see kids taking a more active role in, in, in trying to shape what they eat in school? Should they make it at home and just, just eat more home meals as opposed to eating at school? You know, I, that in a perfect world, that would be my choice is to, you know, make their food and send it to them at school. But, um, the reality is that many of us don't have time to do that. And there's a whole lot of kids walking into the building and eating school lunch programs because they have to, um, maybe it's a financial need. Um, you know, they can't afford, parents can't afford to send them healthy lunches. So you have to look at the whole perspective. I think what, what really needs to happen in our schools is we need to educate teachers and administrators because they're the ones that are going to model just like at home. It's the parents that are modeling and helping these kids make really good decisions. I think at schools, it's the teachers and the administrators. So if we can get those teachers and administrators to, to really take a good hard look at what's in the school lunch program, talking to the school dietitian, because many of these schools have dietitians who manage the cafeteria really talking to them. I worked in one public school in particular and the dietitian was, she was amazing because she really, she wasn't plant plant based per se, but she was really an advocate of kids eating fresh fruits and vegetables. And every time I went through that cafeteria, I could eat if I forgot my lunch, there was sauteed vegetables. She used to put out almonds and raisins, raw almonds and raisins for the kids to put in little containers. And I was really impressed with that. So I think teachers, administrators can really put the pressure on the school uh, cafeteria manager to provide some of those things for the kids. But it, it won't happen until the teachers get on board with that. You've had a big hand, if, if, if not the biggest hand, in, in terms of developing the whole food plant-based meals uh, with Plant Pure, you mm-hmm. know, the, whether it's the frozen meals um, or the kitchen starters for the dry line. So you, you know, the costs to develop yeah. meals and how to make them cost effective, but still healthy and tasty. Cause that's mm-hmm. one of the big mandates with plant pure was developing meals that were tasty because we didn't want to give people the excuse to say, Oh, well, these meals didn't taste very good. So I'm not, I'm not right. going to bother trying at all. Right. Once that's, you know, I tried once that's it. So I'm not going to try uh, any more efforts. What are the low-cost ingredients they could use to develop some healthy meals? Right. I think, you know, see, see, finding seasoning packs, even just the simple little things like finding seasoning combinations can be really inexpensive, um, like a Mexican blend. They can either make it, they can buy it. And it's amazing when you put a Mexican blend on top of some just plain black beans and maybe a little bit of lime juice and, you know, teaching them how to have those pantry items in their cafeteria that I have in my own home. Um, But just learning how to season food with simple ingredients like spices, uh, vinegars, juices, lemons, lime juice, um, can really make a huge difference on the the pinto beans or the rice even. If If you're serving kids just plain white rice, why not bump it up with some seasoning, some blends, maybe adding some beans to it, It'd be amazing how how many of those kids would actually eat it if you put a little flavor in it. So I, I think the first thing is to teach these cafeterias how to make flavors and blends. I think uh, beans being pretty flexible, right, in terms of the, the way you yeah. prepare them. And you just mentioned the few like pinto beans and, and black beans. Black beans high in, in protein. Yeah. Uh, what are your favorite styles i guess of of being of of using those beans i make a a really simple black bean recipe where i put you know lots of garlic and an onion and i put mine in a pressure cooker you could put it in a a crock pot cook it overnight with all of those uh, seasonings i put onions and garlic and lime juice and a mexican blend in there let it cook in some water overnight or put it in your pressure cooker cook it for an hour and then just put your immersion blender in there and just blend it up a little bit. You've got this nice, smooth, creamy uh, bean sauce. You can do this with any kind of bean. And then, you know, it's great over rice. Um, It's great in a taco. The more it sits in the refrigerator, it kind of turns into refried beans, which you can make sandwiches and things and wraps with it. So I think if cafeterias could learn, learn how to make beans and make them tasty and learn how to make, you know, delicious rice that has flavors, I think that's the first first thing and then you know eat 
eating vegetables and fruits that are in season. Um, there, you know, like when squash is in season in the winter time, have sweet potatoes and, and have, you know, winter squash, things like that. I think kids are really open to that, especially if we educate them around it. Well, you talk about kids trying this and then bringing it home. Yes. You know, and, and introduce, so what's the, I guess, how would you recommend uh, a plant-based diet to a family with kids who are, who are not plant-based, but are considering mm-hmm. transitioning, especially because their kids are trying some of these options now in school. Right. Um, I think teaching them the why, Ron, under, kids, kids always want to know why. Why do I have to learn how to add fractions? Why is that important? And so I, I used to, when I was teaching, really show them the everyday um, activities where they're going to need to learn how to use fractions. So teach them how, why this is important for the body and how the body uses this food. And what are the benefits? So kids love, you know, movies and documentaries, and and they love to know the why. So there's great TED Talks out there. Um, One of the movies I love to show the kids, because they always have an aha moment, is just Food Incorporated. Where does your food come from? How is it grown? You know, what, you know, industrial farming, and how's that changed local farmers? Um, So they really, that really resonates with a lot of kids. So get them really thinking about food. And then the next step is to start talk, talking about how the food impacts their life and their body. Forks over knives. Um, but there's just little YouTube quick, short videos for kids with short attention spans um, and just really educating them because that they, they need to know why. You can't just tell them to do something and expect them to climb on board. Yeah, you have a new book, The Clamp Your Kitchen. Mm-hmm. So always your... What was your thought process when you're developing the Plant Pure Kitchen? Um, You know, Plant Pure Kitchen happened almost before Plant Pure Nation came out because I'm constantly all the time developing recipes because that's what I do at Plant Pure Nation for the for the frozen line, for the dry line. So I'm always developing recipes and you know storing them. So the recipes for this book were a lot of them were already there. So um, as soon as Plant Pure Nation came out, I said, you know, I need to, I need to do another book because I've got more recipes. And I have more now because <laughs> it's just ongoing for me. And w- whenever I cook, I like to get creative and, and build and make new things. So I wanted this book to be just more of the same traditional sort of comfort food that people enjoy. I also wanted the simplicity of Plant Pure Kitchen. Plant Pure Nation is very easy to cook from. I think Plant Pure Kitchen's even easier because I got a lot of feedback from people. They wanted shorter recipes. Um, you know, they wanted more gluten-free. They wanted, you know, they wanted less sugar. All the, you know, all the, the feedback that I was getting from people helped to make this a better book. I think they're both good books, but um, I think this, is, this was me learning. Often eating is a social yes. activity to, to be able to do that and to foster and build that type of environment, that culture where it's, it's cool to try if yes. it's cool to try new things. And let's see what we like this. I so, like- I, so I want to share a story because I'm going to interrupt you here on, on trying new things. Um, I used to teach fourth grade and that was one of my favorite grades because they're like sponges. They just, they just love you and they love all the information that you have. So I decided to do a nutrition unit for, cause, because they knew we were plant-based and they were always asking about what we had for dinner. So we did a nutrition uh, unit and for three days I had, we did nothing but experience food and I brought in food, strange things like artichokes and seaweed and, you know, root vegetables that they'd never seen before. And we cooked them. We made smoothies too. We made smoothies with, with green things, you know, using kale and strawberries and bananas. And they were, they were eating the smoothies and loving it and giving me ideas. You know, you could probably put this in there, Mrs. Campbell. And so that was fun. Then we made artichokes and I had a dip and they were dipping the artichokes in the different, you know, uh, dips. And the parents were saying, you've started something because they're wanting me to buy artichokes and they're wanting to make hummus and they're making smoothies. So I, I really felt like I was making progress. So as a teacher, even if you're not plant-based, exposing kids to healthy produce, 
you know, things they've never tried before, trying out smoothies. It's a whole different, you know, way of, of thinking about food. And uh, I, I think I had an, I'd like to think I had an impact on, on those kids. So I think as a teacher, you have a lot of power and you don't even need to teach nutrition without, you don't have to teach nutrition if it's not legal in your school, but you can certainly expose them to food. There's no, there's nowhere that says that you can't do that. And you're still <laughs> sharing your recipes, right? That the teachers can go to uh, plantpurerecipes.com if they wanted to, yes. to, to find more. And of course your book is, I'm assuming it's on Amazon and we yep. know it on the plantpurenation.com. Right. Both, both of those books. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So do you have another book you're writing then with all those extra recipes? You mentioned? We have, we have some thoughts about, about a book. Um, I probably won't do another just generic book. It'll have a theme. Um, and, and I, I've got two or three different ideas for themes that I would like to, like to work on. After I did this, I said I wasn't going to do another one, but I'm definitely going to do another one. <laughs> you know, one specifically for kids and parents and kids. Yes. Might be, uh, a that was thing. one I was, that was one I was definitely thinking of, but I think that kids, um, you know, we always talk about kid friendly foods and foods, that, foods that kids will eat. Kids will eat anything. They will eat anything that you eat if you expose them and make it interesting. So it doesn't necessarily have to be kid-friendly. It just has to be (laughs) people-friendly. Well, there you go. I like that. People-friendly, whole food, plant-based meals uh, can can help start a a child on a a lifelong journey that's healthy and and productive. And and ultimately, uh, hopefully, they spread the word as well with their kids too. And and we need a generation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kim, for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ron. And again, everyone, if you're uh, looking for more information uh, from Kim, visit plantpurenation.com because we have the cookbooks there. Uh, If you've got Amazon, of course, you can check that out too. And plantpurerecipes.com is where Kim has a a lot of great recipes and she's also screened recipes from other people within uh, the Plant Pure Nation uh, membership, uh, our community of people who have been sharing their their favorite recipes as well. So check it out. And don't forget, if you want to learn more about the efforts of the Coalition for Healthy School Food, just visit healthyschoolfood.org. That's the website for the Coalition for Healthy School Food. And you can, as I mentioned earlier, learn more about Plant Your Nation and the efforts of Plant Your Nation within the plant-based movement. Just visit plantpurenation.com. Again, Kim, thank you so much for your time. I know you're busy with the, the launch of this new book and doing podcasts and other uh, interviews. So I really take, I appreciate you taking the time. It's always fun to talk to you, Ron. Thank you much. Bye-bye.